I said essentially the same thing in that clip as I did on Sunday morning, which is President Obama used uh, the Massachusetts health care plan as the blueprint. That's how I dubbed it Obamacare, and I used that same term last night, so I don't understand what the uh, kerfuffle's about. Uh, he said essentially the same thing on both, uh, both appearances. That is Tim Pawlenty responding to some criticism that he really didn't take on Mitt Romney head-to-head uh, -head last night when he could have in the debate. Let's bring in our panel to talk about that and much more. And we have a couple of newcomers. We welcome Jonathan Weissman tonight, reporter with The Wall Street Journal, and also Susan Ferriccio, chief congressional correspondent for The Washington Examiner. And you know him, you love him, syndicated columnist Charles Krauthammer. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so the issue of, uh, as he's termed it, Obamacare came up last night. Uh, Tim Pawlenty had an opening, but a lot of folks think he didn't take it. Susan, did he do as good a job as he could have? I think even though today he's saying he doesn't understand what the kerfuffle's about, I think he realizes it was a missed opportunity. Everyone was waiting for him to define himself against Romney. And though even though they were trying to not go negative, that was pretty clear throughout the debate, this was a chance for him to distinguish himself from Romney. And he really needs to in order to get himself out of the single digits. Romney's a front runner. This was his chance, and he missed it. Well, and Jonathan, I mean, why do you think it, when he's taken so much heat that he's so weak and that he's so vanilla, this seemed like the perfect opening? Yeah, Governor Pawlenty needs to just basically admit that he made a mistake because when you see him saying, I don't understand what this kerfuffle is about, it only digs him in deeper. I mean, this is a guy right now, Mitt Romney, I'll tell you, the Wall Street Journal is going to be coming out with a poll tomorrow that's only going to solidify the notion of Mitt Romney as a leader and the fact that Tim Pawlenty, who has been campaigning very very hard. I've watched him in New Hampshire. I've watched him in Iowa. He hasn't been able to break through. You know, he's not going to get a lot of shots at Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney is basically going to go to ground for most of the summer. There's not going to be another debate until August. And uh, he's not going to get a lot of shots. And, you know, just he can't just go on television and make these statements. He has to be able to say it to Romney's face. And last night he had a chance. He was sitting right next to him and he couldn't do it. All right, Charles, would you say that Pawlenty was one of the losers last night? Did you have winners and losers from the debate? Well, I think he did. He missed an opportunity. But it wasn't because he wasn't aggressive enough. I, I think you can always explain that away in a debate by saying that you're a disciple of Reagan's 11th commandment, mm -hmm. that you don't want to speak ill of a fellow Republican, particularly in an early debate. But what the problem was, I think, is indecision. Uh, he had launched the Obamacare idea that one day earlier, so once you've done that, the die is cast. Then you, it's not enough to say, as Pawlenty did, I was repeating it. Well, if you're going to make a charge that serious, you're merging the two uh, plans in the mind of the electorate, which for a Republican elector is a pretty uh, large accusation. If you're going to do it, you have to follow up. And all he had to do was to add one sentence and advance the ball. All he had to say... The reason that these two are linked is by the individual mandate. That word never came up in the debate as a result of his leaving it out. And the, what he could have said, one sentence is, individual mandate is so toxic to conservatives that they are actually trying to get the courts to throw it out as unconstitutional. Just one sentence, and that would have advanced it. It wouldn't have been terribly hostile, but, but once he made the decision, to go with his line of attack, he should have continued. All right, uh, Susan, any for anyone for you who gained traction last night or benefited from the evening? Certainly Michelle Bachman. She is kind of unknown to the, the vast public, and she came out looking very credi credible and very enthusiastic, and, and she was able to to uh, really sound like she knew what she was talking about. And people have, have been putting her down, basically saying that she's not someone who's a serious candidate. And I think that she proved them wrong by being a really good uh, debater. And to be very, she's very knowledgeable, and uh, she has an impressive background. So I think she's someone everyone's going to be watching now. And she's certainly someone that Pawlenty needs to worry about, especially after last night. All right, let's bring in somebody who was not at the debate last night. Uh, let's listen into the governor of Texas, Rick Perry. The fact is uh, the results are pretty hard to argue. We created more jobs than any other state in the nation over the last decade. Uh, population keeps growing. We're adding four congressional seats to the state of Texas. All right, he's not officially in. He says that he's thinking about running, something he's going to discuss with his family. Uh, but Jonathan, to you, if the governor does decide to run, is it a good idea to base that on his record in Texas 
You know, absolutely at this point. The, the uh, Dallas Federal Reserve Bank just released a report that said that as many as 35 to 40 percent of the new jobs that have been created since the president, uh, since President Obama took office, took, were created in Texas. Um, he's got a very good story to tell. Now, there is a counter argument here. He's got a big budget deficit, like a lot of other uh, a lot of other governors, and there's a, a lot of questions about what kind of jobs those have been. But really, if you look at every other state, uh, Texas is is looking pretty good. All right, Charles, uh, is the country ready for another Republican governor from Texas as president? That's the question. The guess I would make, and this is sort of unknowable, obviously, Perry, who I think is going to declare things that it's not a problem. I think the overhang from the Bush era is still here. I think it's got like a four-year half-life. I think by 2016, Jeb Bush, for example, whose name now is toxic as a result of the, uh, the unhappiness people had in the late years of the Bush administration, second Bush administration, he will be a very strong, he could even end up at the front runner if Obama is reelected. So I think it takes a while. I'm not sure the next election after the end of a, a presidency that ends on a sour note is one where you run on the state or you run on the name. I would, I, I'm not sure. Perry obviously thinks his story strong enough. I would just add there's one factor in the Texas story which, which can't be overlooked. It's got a lot of oil. It's, it's an oil state, and oil has done rather well. Other states don't have as much. All right, panel, good discussion of the 2012 field. Next up, the fight between Boeing and the National Labor Relations Board. Who do you think is going to ultimately win that battle? We would love to hear from you in our online poll at foxnews.com slash special report, and we'll bring you the results when we get back. How do our members in Seattle ever vote fairly on a contract offer? Are they voting on the offer? Are they thinking, oh my God, it may cost me my job because what's Boeing going to retaliate and take next? And that's against the law in all 50 states. Thank God Boeing did not leave the United States. I can't think of a more damaging way to hurt job creation than for this complaint to be successful. And of course, that complaint coming from the National Relation, Labor Relations Board, uh, when Boeing decided to set up shop in South Carolina, uh, which is a right to work state. All right, we asked you before the break. Who's going to win this dispute between Boeing and the National Labor Relations Board? 91% of you said Boeing. 9% said the NLRB. It may be years before we get the decision. So let's talk about it now with our panel. Uh, Jonathan, I'll start with you. I mean, this hearing today in Seattle is just the beginning of something that could last for years. Um, what do you make of this? Because the ramifications go far beyond just Washington and South Carolina, the two states at play here. Yeah, we now have Republicans calling for defunding the National Labor Relations Board. Um, it, it, it's a big political dispute, but remember, it's also a political dispute that speaks to the polls of the parties. Uh, it, it's one where you, you have not seen Barack Obama comment on it. You haven't seen him pull back the NLRB because, you know, this is something that's talking to his labor constituents, and labor constituents have not been particularly happy with this president. Where And the Republicans, on their part, are talking to a certain constituency that cares about and understands the NLRB, but the vast middle of America, the people who actually will decide who the next president is, they're, they're, they're not tuned in on this at all. So I, I, I see that the political fight keeps going on in the fringes, and uh, we won't know how it resolves for, for years. Mm -hmm. Charles, is it too politically radioactive for the president to get involved at this point? Yes. I mean, it's a way that he wants to govern left without appearing to govern left. And that's a result of the midterm elections where he can't get any of this stuff done because he lost control of the House of Representatives, so it's all administrative. That's what he's doing with the EPA. Environmental Protection Agency, which is regulating in a way that would get him the kind of restrictions on energy production that he would get in cap and trade, but he lost on cap and trade in the Congress. So it's a way to go under and around the legislative system, which I think is in and of itself a travesty that three appointees uh, packed by union uh, supporters are telling uh, a, a huge industry where and where it cannot build a factory. This is the president who said he wants to double exports in the next five years, which is extremely important to any American economy. And here he is supporting, by his silence, uh, the regulation of where the biggest exporter of, in our country, the Boeing Company, wants to reduce its costs by building in South Carolina so it could compete with Airbus. And he's undermining this, and of course, paying off the unions to him is more important than a healthy export economy. 
Well, and this could get even uglier on Capitol Hill because now we have word that possibly Senator Lindsey Graham, who you heard there in the soundbite, who is obviously from South Carolina, uh, may in some way block or hold up the president's uh, Commerce Secretary nominee in exchange for the president, uh, maybe indicating or making some kind of statement that Boeing is an ethical company, uh, that there wasn't any wrongdoing. Uh, you know, Susan, how ugly could that get? It, that is a real possibility. I mean, they've held up all, they're threatening to hold up all kinds of nominees over the free trade agreement, so this definitely could happen. Right now, Boeing is saying that they, they're pretty sure they're going to lose this appeal in Seattle, and then when it moves higher to the, to the full board, that they're going to lose that as well. It's a democratically-led board, so that's, that's more than likely to happen. Then it's going to end up in the federal court system. And at that point, I think there's some confidence that, it's, that the, the courts will side with Boeing on this. So ultimately, Boeing will probably prevail in the end. That's the conventional wisdom. But, it, you know, it's definitely, you know, politically speaking, it's, it's putting uh, Democrats on the spot on this issue. And I think it could really turn into a big fight over nominees in the Senate for sure. And, and Jonathan, you know, we got a word on another big union fight today that just a short time ago, the Wisconsin State Supreme Court has now upheld this law that was very controversial. Remember the weeks of protest and mm -hmm. taking over the Capitol there in Madison. Um, how do you think that that, along with this Boeing fight, kind of sets up the stage for discussing union issues in 2012 and in the race? Well, you know, the, the unions, um, the unions were mad, have been mad at President Obama. They feel like he hasn't done, uh, he hasn't done enough for them. He, he's, they're not happy that he is now pushing the Columbia Free Trade Agreement, the Panama Free Trade Agreement, and the South Korea Free Trade Agreement. They feel like he is not, he's not their man uh, the way they had expected. So, when something like this happens, um, it's, it's in the, it's in the president's interest to keep stoking it because this is what's going to get Repub I mean, get the union voters riled up for 2012, not President Obama. And they feel like, wow, they, they need the union voters to get out and vote. And right now, they're going to be voting against Republican governors like John Kasich in Ohio and like uh, Scott Walker in, in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. and, and Charles, we know that the numbers are dipping for union membership yeah. in the U.S. So it, it sounds like they're still very politically powerful, though. Is that power waning? It's waning, and I think as a result, they are resorting to non-democratic ways that I think are scandalous to actually stop the will of the people. Wisconsin is the perfect example. It has an election. It, it votes for a Republican governor who tells you what he's going to do. Uh, the House and the, and the Senate in Wisconsin also are Republican, and they pass a law legally, and they, it's challenged by the unions and the courts, overturned in a kind of scandalous, uh, weird decision by a lower court, by a Democrat, and now I think justice is done. It's been upheld. It was not done in an illegal or irregular manner. And, and, but it's an example of how when you lose your support in the public, as Democrats, liberals, unions have, especially in the midterm election, you undo it either administratively, as Obama is doing with the NLRB, or using the courts. Not the way it's supposed to be done in America. All right, panel, thank you very much. That's it for the panel, but please stay tuned. He is one of the most accomplished men in the world. But he wasn't always an angel while he was working his way up the ladder. The truth, next. Hi, I'm Aaron from Safe Light. On my way to help a couple who had quite a shock this morning. Their side window and windshield were shattered. They called Safe Light. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. I can help you right away. Safe Light has more windshields and side glass in stock than anyone. So I was able to fix it fast. And they were happy. That looks great. Thank you. Because Thanks our work is backed by a national lifetime warranty. So call Safe Light 24 7. Safe Light Repair, Safe Light Replace. Hey, did you ever finish last month's invoices? Sadly, no. Huh. But I did pick up your dry cleaning and had your shoes shine. Well, I made you a reservation at the sushi place around the corner. Well, in that case, I better get back to these invoices. Which I'll do right after making your favorite pancakes. You know what? I'm going to tidy up your side of the office. I can't hear you because I'm also making you a smoothie. Marriott Hotels and Resorts knows it's better for Xerox to automate their global invoice process so they can focus on serving their customers. With Xerox, you're ready for real business. I'm Olympic athlete Mark Spitz, and believe me, I know the value of gold, and so does Lear Capital. With more than a billion dollars of experience buying and selling gold, Lear Capital defines the standard for servicing precious metal investors, making gold easy to buy and easy to sell. And the security of Lear's unique seven-point investor service guarantee can bring priceless peace of mind. With gold outperforming the markets over the past five years, many experts say the best is yet to come. 
Find out why. Call or log on to learcapital.com and ask for our exclusive free special reports. You'll get the beginner's guide to gold investing, four surprising reasons to own gold, plus how to back your retirement accounts with gold. That's important information from the folks who give it to you straight, and it's yours absolutely free just for calling. Plus, for a limited time, be one of the first 500 callers today and receive this authentic U.S. Minted Silver Certificate absolutely free. Call now. Casey Mears drives the number 13 Geico Toyota Camry. Naturally, he saves with Geico. He also drives a motorcycle. He drives an RV and an ATV. Geico insures motorcycles, ATVs, and RVs. We insure almost everything Casey drives. Almost. Geico, saving people money on more than just car insurance. I will send this to Shelly, yeah. and I can have a proposal to you within a half an hour. We're a small business. With 27 of us always in the field, we have to stay connected. We use Verizon tablets, smartphones. We're more responsive. There are no delays. Okay, good. Delays cost money. With Verizon, we do things quicker and more effectively. More small businesses choose Verizon Wireless than any other wireless carrier because they know the small business with the best technology rules. Finally tonight, Admiral Mike Mullen, the current chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, has been praised for a lifetime of achievement and bravery. But it sounds like, based on his college years, he really could have gone either way. Well, in the last year that I was there, uh, my senior year, uh, you can only get 150, and if you get 150 demerits, you get kicked out. And I managed to to uh, uh, get 115 within the first month. Uh, <laughs> wait, wait a minute, and now you're the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff? I mean, does anybody look at your records? <laughs>